Oh, hello. Good, how are you? It's so nice to actually talk like live. Hi, thank you for joining me. I am Macy and this is Bex, Leo's mom. And today we're gonna talk a little bit about her and their story. Thanks for having me. It's nice to nice to chat with you. Absolutely. So do you want to start back all the way to your pregnancy journey? Yeah, so I feel like as long as I can remember, I've wanted to be a mum. When my husband and I had been married for, I think it was like six years, five or six years, we started talking about having kids and we were like relatively lucky to fall pregnant pretty fast, but I had two miscarriages. Um, And then, so when I fell pregnant with Leo, I was like really happy, but really nervous you know um and our pregnancy with Leo was like it was I think in the scheme of things now like relatively uncomplicated but there was like lots of little things that came up that made us like quite nervous like just like little things I'd find and then would have extra scans and then it would be fine you know um But yeah, overall, it was relatively uncomplicated and I really did enjoy being pregnant. I think especially now I look back on it and it was like a really special time um, for us. And I think now I can still look at it and be like, it was, it was like, it was a really happy time. Like I'm really thankful for it. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe I'll pick out his name. Um, Names are actually really hard. So we did, so we did find out the gender. Um, we found out through a blood test at, I think it, I think we found out when I was about 13 weeks pregnant um, and straight away my husband and I were like, okay, like let's chat about names. And I don't know why we found it so much harder. Like, I think we always had like a girl name in mind, just like from when we were dating, we talked about it. But then when it came to boy names and also I think once you know, it's like for a human it changes it like we had names we liked and then when it was like okay this is for like the, the baby that's inside of me yeah. for some reason it was like way scarier and like a lot of names are like nah 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 actually those won't work um and so I really liked Leo I I honestly don't remember where I had heard it um I just had it on my list I think it was like my top name um but we had like three three names in total and we like we made the decision to not name him until he was born um but I honestly wasn't sure if I'd call him Leo for certain when he was born after everything that happened my husband said to me you choose the name like he was really set on me choosing it after everything I'd been through with the birth which was really lovely but I looked up the meanings of all the names I had looked up the meanings of the names in pregnancy but I think after the birth I looked them up and Leo means like lion-hearted and brave and it just like perfectly fit him and everything that had happened and so straight away I saw that because I looked up all three names that we had again and I saw that and I was like his name's Leo and it fit him so perfectly you know looks like a Leo too yeah he does eh? Mm -hmm. yeah so going into your birth did you have like any birth plan or were you just kind of going with the flow of things yeah um so I think I'd heard like so many people tell me that their birth hadn't gone to plan um like not always traumatic stuff or anything it just hadn't gone to plan and so I I did have that in the back of my mind so I tried not to like have a set set plan but Mm -hmm. to be honest I feel like even when you say that you kind of do like you have an ideal in your head right Mm -hmm. um and so I really like I just I had this thing like I really just wanted to try and do like have my birth like unmedicated for as long as I could like I wasn't against getting like an epidural or anything like that I was just like let me just see like I would love to see how like if I could do it yeah. um we we did plan to have the birth at the hospital um there was like a few little things there was a reason for that but yeah we just thought I will have it at the hospital but labor at home for as long as we can but already it didn't go to plan because I didn't go into labor. I was like well past my due date was 41 weeks and I was showing no signs of labor. 
um, and he was re like measuring relatively big. So they made the choice to induce me. Um, so yeah, I didn't like, I was hoping I didn't have to be induced, but that's what they recommended at the time. So uh, yeah, I went, I went with that. Mm. Yeah. So do you want to walk us through a little bit of your birth story and just everything that happened? Yeah. So I guess that's where it started. Um, I was 41 weeks pregnant and I think at 40 weeks, uh, Leah was already measuring um, four kgs, which is around nine pounds, I believe. Um, so he was, a, he was a big boy. Um, and so they were just saying like, it's probably safer to get things going. Um, so we went into the hospital on the 1st of September, 2022, and we started um, induction with like oral medication and so we got there like 7 30 in the morning and it started and it actually was like a really lovely day it was a beautiful sunny day and we just I would have like a dose of the medication and then go for a walk and then we would like relax and chill out and so the day itself was actually quite nice um but it was the evening when things started to go downhill for us it was around 7 30 p.m so 12 hours after my induction started when I went started showing signs of early labor um which was like you know that part was normal kind of as expected um and then about 10 p.m I got checked and I was only one centimeter dilated so the way inductions generally work well in New Zealand anyway that's one part I didn't say at the start I'm in New Zealand um they usually do like one day of induction and then if you're not like in full-blown labor they encourage you to try and sleep and then they do start the induction again in the morning to kind of give you a, a, like a bit of a rest so I was one centimeter dilated and so that was kind of the vibe like okay go get some sleep um but I was like starting to struggle quite a lot and in my head like with pain and in my head I was thinking like straight away I was like god like I can see why people get epidurals like this is a really really hard but I was like so determined to like push through and like really grit it out and try and go as long as I can because I was like I'm still in induction suite like I'm not even in labor and delivery which is where they move you once you're in um, like active labor and so I was just trying to grit it out and yeah I guess I was struggling I had a tens machine on and I got checked at I think midnight and like on the monitor everything was fine and so they kind of said like okay like try and get some sleep I took some medication to try and like ease off the pain but I do remember thinking in my head like I, like I feel like I'm in quite a lot of pain but anyway I like pushed through it that's labor um and so I did this for a couple more hours um and about 3 a.m in the middle of the night I like screamed out in pain and I was struggling to breathe which again I was like this is labor right like this is quite like this is extremely hard but and so my husband was trying to come like gen genuinely trying to get me to breathe like help me breathe and a hospital midwife came in and was like I heard you screaming is everything okay and that's when my husband was saying like no like I'm quite worried like she doesn't seem to be coping um and the advice was to get in the shower like try and you know just um grit it out a little bit longer which we did um but then when I got checked again when the midwife another midwife came in and they said, okay, like, let's put you on the monitor and get you checked. And that's kind of when they realized like something was like terribly wrong. It got escalated pretty fast from there um, to a doctor and he came in, he um, touched my stomach. It was hard. So he called for um, a bedside scanner and it was when he scanned my stomach he realized that, well, they didn't tell me at the time or my husband, but that's when they realized I was bleeding internally. And so my uterus had torn and ruptured, um, which 
no one would have expected because I'm a first time mom. So it was like very rare. And it was at that point that, yeah, I was bleeding internally. They turned to my husband, Ben, and said like, I, Rebecca's extremely weak. She's not going to be able to give birth vaginally. Um, but I need to get her in for a C-section right now and told him like, you can't come because we're going to have to call it code red, which is, I'm not too sure if that term is the same across all countries, but it just essentially means like high level emergency. So like all hands on deck. Um, and so that was called and pretty much I was pulled straight out and rushed down to theater and I was knocked out. So I was put under general anesthetic. Um, and when they delivered Leo, he was unresponsive. Um, we, yeah, he had gone without oxygen or deprived oxygen for an unknown period of time. They can't pinpoint exactly when my uterus ha had ruptured, um, but it had been more than an hour with like limited oxygen. Um, so he was unresponsive when he was born. Um, and the, a, a pediatrician they had at the hospital managed to get his heart started after six minutes. Um, and they got him on a ventilator and oxygen. And he started actually responding relatively well at that point. Um, and so my, my husband thought, I think it's like might actually be okay. But at that point I was still in surgery um, he didn't know how I was doing. Um, when I came out, they told me that um, I had lost five and a half liters of blood while they were trying to stop the bleeding internally. Um, but they did manage to repair my uterus. So that was good. And I remember waking up um, and just straight away saying, is, is my baby okay? And them saying, yes. And I remember thinking at that point, like, phew, like, that was such a close call, but thinking, like, he's okay, so that means everything's fine now, right? Um, so then I woke up, Ben came in and pretty much told me um, that he had to go straight to NICU. The hospital I delivered at didn't have a NICU, so, he, so Leo got transferred straight away, so I hadn't met him yet, and I got moved to... I think it was like ICU recovery area and they told Ben that they didn't think they'd be able to transfer me to be with Leo for like at least 24 hours because I was so weak um so they were just trying to monitor me to see how I responded to the surgery if I'd have to go back in um because obviously I'd had a c-section but that also repaired my uterus and I'd also lost the five and a half liters of blood um, but I did actually like, um, recover. Okay. Um, all things considered, and they were able to move me to the other hospital after that. And I was able to meet, um, Leo, thankfully. So at this time you are still, you're thinking like, my baby is totally okay. Like everything yeah. is going to be fine. And you're just, okay. Yeah, I think that was the crazy thing. And I think a lot of it is just I was in so much shock, you know, like I went from being in labor thinking like everything was normal. Like this is my first baby. I don't know what normal labor is. I was just thinking like here it is extremely hard. Um, and then all of a sudden people are rushing in. No, nothing's okay. I'm knocked out. And Leo still, but I wake up and I'm not pregnant anymore you know but I'm being told like my baby's okay like he's okay Ben had met him thankfully and was able to be with him and he was showing me photos and it's such a like such a strange experience like you think your whole pregnancy you know you think about that moment meeting your baby and they're like there yeah, I was like looking at like photos of him on a screen and like I'm so thankful that Ben had taken those photos for me to see that because I missed 12 hours of his life you know um and so I felt like while I was waiting to go meet him I could like look at stuff like videos photos like that Ben had taken that nurses had taken that I was so thankful for um but 
yeah like when even when I say it I feel like very disassociated to it because it's still so much shock I hate like I can't believe that that was our reality you know um so yeah it's very um, very insane uterus rupture what is that like is that what it's called like uterine rupture yeah so that's what it's called I'd never even heard of it before I was um pre like before that happened to me and I thought you know I'd heard about a lot of things um but I'd never heard of a uterine rupture so a uterine rupture typically happens um when in a VBAC when women attempt a vaginal birth after a c-section and you're and it, that in itself is also rare um but it's the most common type of uterine rupture if that makes sense so the pressure of contractions will cause your uterus to rupture along a scar so like along a c-section scar is the most common sometimes women had to have have had uterine surgeries for things like fibroids or something similar and and that's also you can potentially rupture across that scar again very rare but then for a uterine rupture to happen in a first time mum no scars on the uterus is extremely extremely rare it obviously does happen like I have connected with other women since where it does happen but there's extremely limited research on it um even when it first happened I was asking specialists like why like why and even they couldn't really tell me like they didn't have they weren't confident in giving me answers because they would just say like we could speculate on what caused it but we they don't like to say just because there's there's limited research on it you know um so that was very hard for me at first because I just wanted to know why, like why it could happen. And I think a lot of people want to reason, you know, and, and figure out what caused it. But it just couldn't. Like I have, I guess I have some of my own ideas now, but I also am hesitant to like share them because I don't want to scare people because again, there it's is just, there isn't enough research on it yet, you know? All, mm -hmm. I've known a little bit about it, but I from the knowledge that I had, normally it's very rare for um, it to be repaired. And also yeah. most babies, aren't they, correct me if I'm wrong, like they're stillborn when mm. that happens. So it seems like from what I heard from your story that both of yours, like all of it was just a rare, very, very rare case. Yeah, you are, you, yeah, you are right. Um, because usually when uterine ruptures do happen, if they are happening along a C-section scar or another scar, usually the rupture, it will like completely rupture against the whole scar. So your uterus essentially becomes like wide open. Sometimes the baby will be found in the abdomen. Um, and some women will have like the seat like this the rupture is so bad it will like wrap around like they can be like extremely awful and and those are usually the cases where it can't be repaired because it's like you know it's it's too badly damaged um when say if it does rupture only against a c-section scar they uh from my knowledge I think they can often repair it um but yeah with my one what happened was it was my uterus was tearing before it ruptured so how it was explained to me that is that I think uteruses have seven different layers I didn't know that before but so internal layers were slowly ripping and so when I was thinking this is labor pain it was actually I was in a lot more pain than, than was what was normal but I didn't know that at the time I also thought it was because I'd been induced and you do get told like induced labor is worse um, but so like my uterus was tearing um, inside and then there was just one point where all seven layers completely ruptured so I had what you call a pinpoint rupture so the rupture itself wasn't too bad like in terms of the damage like they could find the rupture point and repair it but what caused the damage um, to Leo is that as soon as I think it was as soon as um my uterus started tearing um 
how is it explained? Um, the oxygen to the placenta is compromised because you're not getting big enough breaks between contractions. So I wasn't getting enough oxygen to my placenta, I think. I mean, I could be, um, these are the part of the details I'm a little bit hazy on still, like that part. But then what I know for certain is once I did rupture, the blood your blood um, gets pumped obviously to your uterus, to your placenta, but mine, because it had ruptured, was going straight out of my uterus into my abdomen. So no blood was going to the placenta, which means no oxygen was going to my placenta, which means, yeah, Leah was out without oxygen or was deprived of oxygen for a long period of time. We believe like over an hour at least. Um, and so that, yes, a lot of babies, um, who are lost from uterine ruptures are often stillborn because that's a long time to be without oxygen for or deprived oxygen. And in our case, it caused um, Leo to have organ damage as well as like severe brain damage. Um, they don't always know why some babies survive longer than others. Like some survive for a few days, some survive for like, two to three weeks which is our case um and some are stillborn it, 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 for whatever reason it depends on how the brain has been damaged from the lack of oxygen um and so every case is like a little bit different but it is usually a bit rarer for them to still live for a period of time afterwards which is yeah crazy so walk us through the moment that you got to like go to the hospital and see him and like what mm -hmm. y'all did together because you have so many beautiful photos of y'all spending time together yeah yeah so I remember them just coming and telling me that they're going to transfer me to the hospital that Leo was at and being excited like everything that had happened I was just so excited to meet my baby you know like I had seen some photos but I just wanted to meet him um and so they transferred me to the hospital. When I got there, they kind of had to check me, do checks to make sure I was okay. And then they took my hospital bed, wheeled me into NICU. And I think that moment was so crazy because I remember being wheeled in and Leah was in his NICU bed with my husband and I was like just trying to see him straight away. And they wheeled me up to him. And I think like that moment, like even though it was so different to how I ever imagined meeting my baby I still felt like I got the same feeling that you know I think most people get when they meet their baby like just this overwhelming like love and emotion I just remember like being seeing her just his little legs and arms and just crying like I was just so happy to meet him you know and just hold like I couldn't hold him but I was kind of just I also with my surgery like I couldn't really sit up so they were like trying to put the barrier of my bed down and lower his bed down so I was kind of just like leaning over to him um, and that moment was like really really beautiful um, and then yeah and then from there like it was it was a mix of like very joyful moments and very, very painful moments. It was like the craziest experience, like feeling so much joy, but feeling so much pain at the same time. The first few days, like when I look back on it, I have to say like I was in full denial. Like I, I wholeheartedly believed that like nothing was wrong and that we were going to go home. I thought he was in Niku just as a precaution and like no one had actually told me that but I'm thinking that was like what my brain did to literally help me survive um I had to recover from you know the surgery and the blood loss and so I almost feel like my brain told me that so I could recover um because the next day like the next two days I could I could couldn't actually physically get up to be put in the wheelchair to go see Leo the second day I managed to get up but I was like extremely high on <laughs> painkillers and then the third day I, I physically couldn't I think that the just everything the blood loss everything just like hit me and I just slept couldn't move um and then I think it was the fourth day when I started to feel a little bit better and I was visiting him more in Niku. Um, but 
I think the hard thing is my husband was down in Nico on his own doing a lot of the specialist appointments and he was very aware of how bad the condition with Leah was but was trying to tell me but I was like no that's not true you know what I mean um I think Ben might have told me on the fourth day that the specialists were really worried because he wasn't showing any brain activity and I just remember thinking like that like that will turn around like that's just a blood blood it will be fine um and then on day five Ben told me that they wanted to do an MRI of his brain and that wasn't a good sign because they generally only do MRI brain scans on day five if they're worried um if babies have had like oxygen loss if they're doing okay they'll usually do an MRI on day 10 um and that's how Ben knew but I again was like it will be okay like they just want to like check double check like it's all good you know and so they did a brain scan and yeah and then he it came back we got called into a meeting and they told us that it was catastrophic it was complete and total brain damage um and essentially that there was nothing more that they could do for him and I think I remember in that moment just I just remember going like completely blank and staring at the wall and it's like my body physically couldn't process that information um and from there honestly like my memory is so hazy all our family came in um my one of my really good friends came in to take photos and it was like yeah like nothing can describe that time because it's like we had to try and process the fact that we had such limited time left and we were told we have anywhere from two days to two weeks left and to essentially like they'll do everything they can to make him comfortable um, and we were given the option to go home if we would like and we moved on to a program called um, palliative care which is very similar to hospice care where they just that they want to make him comfortable um, and they want you to just make, you know, enjoy your time with them. We chose to stay in the hospital. I was mostly scared to go home because I didn't know what to expect. He still needed some care and I was worried that what if we like, I, I guess overall I was just super worried. Like I didn't know what to expect. Um, and so they were very like kind to us at the hospital um the children's hospital in New Zealand called Starship and they cared for us like amazingly they gave us a parents room um they helped us with a lot of things and yeah we just try to make the most of our time with him we went out for breakfast together every day we went for walks in the park we had our family and friends there um you know we were out in the sun a lot and it it was like the yeah the most beautiful but heartbreaking time because we were having all these like beautiful memories with you know our son but we knew that every single day at the end of the day I would wonder like is, is there going to be another day we we're like we truly didn't know and we knew that like we were more expecting like three to like you know two to three days and so every day we got after that we were like Oh, that that's amazing but like is it are we going to get another day um so yeah every day we had with him honestly was a blessing and we had longer than we expected which yeah we're so thankful for so tell us a little bit more about life after child loss um oh like I think I remember the early days you're just in such a daze you know so um I think I mentioned before we had chosen to stay at the hospital as the time went on and we were realizing we were probably going to get closer to that like two more weeks left with him uh, like the hospital was getting really hard and so we chose to go back to my in-law's place and we had two days with Leo there um, and so he passed away at um, my in-law's house we chose to go there because at the time we were renting a fairly small place um, while we're building and we just 
honestly, we just didn't, we were too scared to be by ourselves. Um, and Ben's parents have a relatively big house. So we were able to have lots of people there. Um, and I, yeah, so we went to Ben's parents and we ended up staying there for two months. Um, and that was extremely helpful because those first two, you know, those first two to three months, really, we just were surviving. I remember thinking like, if I can have a shower, like I'm doing really well. And so each day I would try and get up and have a shower and that's about all I would do. Um, and that's purely because it made me feel, you know, like a, a little bit better. Um, but we just had lots of family around, um, some close friends and that is what really helped. They were just helping us to function. Um, I think the hardest part for me was, um, at the start of this year when it was about four months after losing Leo, we kind of, it was like at the point where I kind of had to be like, okay, what, what's my life now, you know, and I had to kind of get back to reality somewhat um I'd had about four months off working um mostly and I run my own photography business and I do weddings so I had weddings booked and I kind of had to make the call if I was going to shoot them or not you know and so I decided to do it because I felt like I needed something to keep me going and that was a good choice. It was, it did really help to keep me going, but I found as each week went on and I was having to get more back to reality, I started to fall a lot into just like this, into depression because I was like really struggling to believe that this was my reality, you know? Um, I think what helped me survive through that and I, everyone's going to be so different depending on your personality, but I had to give myself purpose each day. And for me, that ended up being my work. And so it very much looked like writing to-do lists every single day. Didn't always like, you know, do great at it, but I think just looking and having something, I guess, with purpose to my day really, really did help me. Um it, like the people, our friends and family who continued to support us through that time by bringing us meals and like checking in, I think is also what helped us survive. We were terrible, terrible with eating. I was, the, I think that was the thing that was the hardest for us because we were just like, neither of us could be bothered cooking, like let alone, you know, supermarket shopping or whatever. Um, so we were really thankful to survive for, you know, a, we had a lot of, um, freezer meals given to us and, and that helped us a lot um I think we're we're just over a year since losing Leo um there's still many days I do really struggle just with that like heavy feeling of depression um I think I've I've gotten to this place now though where I really try to remind myself that each day I feel like I'm living for the I need to live for the both of us for both Leo and I and I think that's what keeps me going now you know um I do feel like for me I just try to honor him as best as I can in my everyday life and yeah to me that looks like just trying to live the best life possible not always getting it right but um trying to you know I think you're doing amazing just through what we see on social media, like your beautiful videos. And weren't you running a 10K? Yes. I thought I was like, she's so cool. Like, look at her. Go. Oh, thank <laughs> you. Yes, that was part of it as well. I think at the start of the year, I was like, I needed some, I guess it kept coming back to purpose for me. Um, and so um my husband and I decided to, we're going to be running a half marathon at the end of the month in memory of Leo. So we've been trying to train throughout the year. It's going all right. <laughs> I'm a little bit nervous for it, but I think it should be good. And we're raising money for Starship, which was the Children's Hospital in New Zealand who looked after Leo and looked after us so well. So yeah, we'll be doing that at the end of the month, which I, um, I hope will feel really good. Well, thank you so much for sharing your story. I thank think, you. I mean, just everything you're doing is amazing. I really appreciate it. And I know so many people are going to watch this and like have similar stories and just, mm -hmm. you know, that's what this is about, making sure people don't feel alone. And so 
I yeah. Just, I love him. He's just so perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks so much. And it's so nice to connect with you. That's actually one thing I forgot to say. Connecting with other lost parents has helped immensely. Um, so yeah, I've really appreciated talking to you and all the other girls. It's been so, so helpful just to not feel so alone, you know? Um, yeah. Well, thank y'all everyone for watching. We appreciate it.